Your Education Matters focuses on informing the public about the institutions of education through dialogue with professional educators. Typically, the educators best known to the public are those in leadership positions, such as Superintendent of Schools, Deputy Minister of Education, and University President. Andrew Petter, the new president of Simon Fraser University, is one of those highly visible educational leaders. Raised largely in Victoria and educated at UVic and Cambridge University, President Petter entered politics in the 1990s and headed six provincial ministries, including advanced education. Subsequently, he served as Dean of UVic's Faculty of Law. His background in politics, law, and universities gives Petter a unique vantage on the office of president. We are interested to know his appraisal of the status quo in BC higher education and his vision for his term of service at SFU. To explore such issues, we welcome President Andrew Petter to Your Education Matters. President Petter, we're interested in people's career profiles in education, and you've had an unusual and I may say very successful and diverse career, but we're interested to know what in your background, in your family life and early experience enabled you to get an education that led to this sort of career. Well, I grew up in a family that thought education was <laughs> the key to virtually everything in terms of uh, human progress and uh, individual fulfillment. Uh, my dad was a university professor. Uh, my mom taught dance and went to the Bowdoin Visa Ballet, uh, always part of the Bowdoin Visa Ballet at the Vienna Academy. So it was inculcated me, in me from an early age that education was the key that would unlock doors uh, for my future and, and for the future of society. That's a common theme we hear is that uh, a person, could be both parents, but oftentimes the mother is a key factor in opening the possibility of motivation to a student so that they continue on in education successfully. Now these roles of MLA and Minister, uh, Dean of Law, and then University President, uh, they're fairly diverse roles, and I wanted to uh, ask you to explore a little bit with me what in your educational background prepared you to do this range of things. Well, I, 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 maybe I've never been able to hold a job, Paul, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, I, I enjoy the diversity of uh, human experience that, uh, that's available to us as human beings. I like people. I like public policy, I love learning, and these roles all have dimensions of that. So uh, to be a university teacher and engage with students uh, is a very exciting uh, occupation for me. I was back teaching as recently as last year uh, in a full-time basis. Uh, to be in, able to be uh, in public service and engage with uh, the community and act on its behalf is something that I found exciting, sometimes frustrating, but more often than not uh, very stimulating. And being an academic administrator is the thing I came to last and thought, ooh, the word administrator, I wouldn't want to be one of those. But in fact, being an academic administrator gives one a chance to support and, and energize uh, the ideas that are based in an institution through its students, through its faculty. And I found I was able at UVic Law, and I'm starting to find, I hope I'm right, at SFU, that by being a force that can motivate and harness the energy of students and faculty, uh, the energy of an educational institution, being an administrator isn't such a bad thing. It's a pretty exciting thing, in fact, and, and, uh, and one that I find equally fulfilling. So some elements of your education, I suppose, we would classify as liberal arts and some as more technical and professional. Uh, as an undergraduate, I think you were more of a liberal arts major, weren't you? Yeah, no, I, I, again, I dabbled in virtually everything. Uh, I think I was a political science major, but I took film history, I took courses in psychology, philosophy. Um, I mean, I think the, the capacity that education gives one to think critically, to explore different avenues of, uh, of, of thought and, uh, and understand the important uh, dimensions of what, uh, what make up a, a society and, and, and contribute to, to knowledge, hugely important. Uh, at the same time, having some specialization, having some knowledge of a particular area, once you've figured out what that area is, uh, building on top of that can hone one's uh, critical thinking and direct it in ways that have greater application than would be the case if you didn't have that professional training. So in my case, the liberal arts base, the legal training on top of that, 
uh, I felt equipped me very, very well to uh, initially become a lawyer and, and then in short order to become a legal academic. I don't know about you, but it, it was ironic to me that I ended up making my living as an administrator, and that's one area I never took any coursework in. That's true. Uh, although, you know, administration, it, it is a word that, that's a little scary when you first think about it. But so much of what I think of as administration now, having done it, is really about relationships. It's about, uh, it, it's about uh, working with people, energizing people, acting on their behalf. Uh, a university president has to understand and work with government, has to uh, ha maintain good relations with the community, has to, within the academy, uh, harness the, the energy and hopefully help to fulfill the vision of students and faculty. It's very much about relationships. And once you understand that, it becomes a little less scary and a little more fulfilling. Well, thanks. I, I <laughs> chose to interpret the job that way, too, and I guess delegated to somebody else the, the ledgers and that part of the job that I felt less adept at. I, uh, I wanted to ask about these two of the cultures that you've worked in, one being government and the other being universities. What do you notice uh, that's different about the cultures and that leads to misunderstandings? On the other hand, what's common between them and facilitates cooperation and understanding? They're really two different worlds to some degree. They, they are, you know, and I think there has been uh, difficulties in the two worlds understanding each other. And what I'd like to think is having come from both of those worlds, that, that will help me to, to bridge the gap really to help uh, the university achieve its goals, but also to help government better understand uh, universities and be able to support them in a way that, that meets government's objectives. Uh, what's similar? What's similar is they both have public mandates. They're both very much focused on trying to achieve some vision of, of a public good. Uh, governments do that uh, and universities do that. Having said that, they operate very differently. Uh, governments tend to, uh, particularly in a parliamentary model with an executive, uh, decisions tend to be made in a more top-down way. They're directed through ministers and cabinets, uh, through uh, senior public service, uh, in a way that uh, decisions are made and then implemented. Uh, universities are much more bottom-up. Uh, much more of a community. The whole tradition of collegial governance is something that perplexes people in government and people who come from government into universities. And so uh, what one has to understand with universities is if you're going to lead, uh, I like to say one leads from behind. One leads by understanding and supporting and motivating, not by directing and, uh, and, and, and trying to impose upon the university one's own vision, but rather draw out of it what is the best uh, of the university through collegial governance and through support of the vision that comes out of that model. So there's difficulty, I think, understanding how the two operate. I, I also think there's frustration um, within government because I think government is the main supporter of public education. And I'm not sure people in public education always appreciate that. I worry, frankly, uh, as someone who's been in government, that the value of public service has been uh, reduced in, in the public's eyes generally in recent years. People don't look upon elected leaders in the same way they did, uh, certainly when we had people like John Diefenbaker and Lester Pearson and Tommy Douglas. In the post-Watergate era, I think, creeped across the border and, and there's a high degree of cynicism. And the, some of that has permeated universities. And I think we need to understand people in public service, for the most part, in my experience, almost all, are there for what they well, for the best reasons, to try to bring about what they believe is in the best interests. We may not agree with what they say, but we should respect them, we should work with them. And when they try to do something that is positive, it should be celebrated and, and recognized as such when it meets our goals as well. Uh, so when I was in government, uh, I, I, I was very aware of the difficulty of trying to mobilize government to support universities if in fact universities were not going to give some recognition and support to governments that did that. I think now I'm in a university setting, it is important that we, we work with government, but we also, and we crit critique government when it doesn't meet our objectives, but that we don't sit on our hands and, uh, and, and stand silent when government does make important investments in education, does make education a priority, and tries to move forward in that regard. The relationship to time, I think, is a difference. You know. Uh, uh, and political leaders need headlines, and they need them often, whereas universities are famous for moving slowly. Uh, the slow process might be a good deliberative process, but I think that's an example of a clash uh, where 
universities uh, can't respond on a dime, but government oftentimes wants an overnight change. Well, you know, different governments are different. I mean, provincial governments in Canada are remarkably nimble compared to, say, federal governments or governments in the United States where you've got uh, d different locuses of power and deadlock can emerge. Within a parliamentary system at a provincial level, I agree, governments uh, want to and can move quickly. Having said that, Simon Fraser University is pretty nimble too. In fact, one of the strengths of Simon Fraser University has been its ability to be flexible, to be responsive. So I think there may be more in common there, <laughs> with this university at least, and government. Well, I think a lot of that at SFU is dependent on trust. I saw a number of things while I was dean uh, where the faculty senate did concur with the administration, took risks uh, because they had faith in the leadership and therefore they were able to be nimble as you're saying. So I agree with you that SFU has been able to make some of those quick responses. Well, well a really good example of that would be the, the campus in Surrey where government was uh, looking for, for uh, a solution to what, what uh, was going to happen to that campus, it was previously going to be Tech BC. Simon Fraser previously had not had aspirations to locate in Surrey and yet somehow the two came together. So there's an example of exactly what you're saying. Fraser International College was a big gamble, a wise one, that was taken, I thought, because the faculty had confidence in the administrators who were knowledgeable in the area of international, and they gave them the right to go ahead with what has turned out to be, I think, an excellent experiment. Now, the role of university president, to get a little more specific in these relationships, do you think it's changing, has changed? Was there a golden age of university presidents when they pontificated widely and were not accountable to public opinion? <laughs> uh, this is your first presidency and it's a big job at a big university. What are some of your thoughts on the presidential, the presidential role at this point? Well, first of all, I was told this was the golden age of university presidents <laughs> when they hired me, so I'm shocked to think it might not be. <laughs> Um, look, I think the role has changed. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we lived uh, in an era previously where maybe university presidents, and I'm thinking back 20, 30 years, could count on, on government funding uh, to a greater extent than is the case now, uh, could uh, be more inwardly focused perhaps. Um, clearly now universities are much more exposed to the competitive environments of uh, the marketplace in the sense that much of our funding now has to be derived from non-governmental sources. Um, in the case of Simon Fraser particularly, but not exclusively, the relationship with community is essential. Uh, we're no longer uh, the ivory tower if we ever were. I don't think Simon Fraser ever, ever was, but to the extent it was the university on the mountain, it's come down from the mountain and very much is in community. Uh, even on the mountain, it's in community programmatically in a lot of ways. So the role of the university president is much more outward looking. It's much more engaged with the community. It involves much more interaction with government because uh, government's not uh, to be taken for granted, nor should it be. It requires uh, more activity in, in fundraising and relationship building to bring in the necessary resources. Having said that, I'm the kind of person who likes uh, being outward looking. I, I, what I really believe in is important in the university in addition to the education of students, which is our core mission, uh, research, which is uh, hugely important as well. But what I really like is the university's relationship with all the larger community, with government, with, with all the players. That excites me. It gives an added uh, dimension to education for students who are in co-op programs, for faculty who are doing research in the community, and for a university president who's out there uh, talking about why universities really matter to the larger community. So you may have heard me say this, but I think Simon Fraser is an exciting opportunity for me and for, for us all because it is student-centered, research-driven, and community-engaged. Okay, we'll pick up those themes in just a moment. Thank you, Andrew. We'll be back in a moment. For more than 40 years, the Faculty of Education at SFU has been delivering academic programs that are innovative and responsive, based on the academic research of our professors and the expertise of practice teachers from your communities. Our programs are designed to meet classroom needs. As a community, we're piecing together a successful education experience for students today and in the future. Education matters. Education matters. Welcome back. Andrew, you, uh, where we left off, you were talking about community outreach and service as well as teaching, uh, in addition to research and scholarship as roles of the faculty of the university. 
and I wanted to ask you to expand some on how we could encourage more of an emphasis at research universities and comprehensive universities like SFU into these areas outside of research and scholarship, which many citizens feel are extremely important, but traditionally have uh, fallen into the background in the evaluation of faculty and in the reward structure of universities. Well, I guess what I, where I'd start with is to say one of the reasons I, I wanted to come to SFU, and it's been affirmed because I've been going around department by department, is that in fact at SFU there is a continuing very strong commitment to teaching and an extraordinary uh, expression of community engagement through the co-op program, but also through research and other activity. So although I don't disagree with you that the reward structure does privilege research or make it easier to evaluate research, SFU is an example of an institution where the culture is still pretty supportive of the, uh, the, the value of teaching as, as a central component of what universities are about and the community connection. I would say SFU is, is more community oriented than virtually any other institution of its size, certainly in Canada. So how do we, how do we affirm that? Well, you hire a president who believes that, that uh, as important as research is, it's no more important than teaching. And as important as the university is, its importance is amplified and, uh, and made, made greater by connection with community. Uh, but it doesn't take one person, obviously. What, what I'm hoping to do, and I'm, I'm challenging uh, the university to do with me, is to develop a strategic vision around the value of teaching, around the value of community engagement, as well as around the value of research. How do we articulate our vision in a way that celebrates those three dimensions uh, and I'm, I believe if you have that kind of vision, and if the community sees it, both internally and externally, the instruments will be found. Um, and you're the professional educator, Paul, more than me, uh, but I, I'm convinced the instruments will be found that will align with that and reinforce the value of all three of those dimensions as we go forward. Well, I hope so, because uh, I think uh, besides its social utility, there's a great deal of satisfaction of available for faculty members, you know, if they contribute in these ways. There's, there's an immediacy and a personal return on the areas of community service and teaching that I think humanize the, the job and keep you well, invigorated throughout your career. I, I completely agree with that and, and actually that's what gives me even more hope. Those faculty members who do take their teaching or their research into the community come away with a sense of fulfillment and accomplishment that is that much greater. And, and so I, I think if we can inspire people to do that, if we can inspire some of our, our best researchers to get back into first year classrooms if they aren't already there, I think they will find that the being challenged by undergraduate students who've just come out of uh, the community and asked those fundamental questions can be very rewarding. I, I was myself last year in a first year constitutional law class. I've never enjoyed teaching more. And so if we can regain that sense of excitement amongst those who, who may have lost it and affirm it for those who still have it, uh, I, I'm very hopeful. Well, your comments about undergraduate are very germane for SFU because it's become such a major factor in the undergraduate presentation of education in BC with such large incoming classes year after year. In, in that context, I'd, I'd like you to give us a picture of the landscape of BC higher education and how SFU fits into this. There's been a lot of changes just in the last few years, the creation of a lot of new universities and other things have happened. So where's SFU's place in all of this? Well, I guess the first thing I'd say is it's a pretty good picture. And, uh, and I think the government can take some, some pride in the fact that three of our research universities have just been ranked in the top 200 universities in the world, not just in Canada, but in the world. That's pretty extraordinary. Uh, I don't think it's recognized within the province. So often we, we have to have people outside tell us we're doing a good job. Uh, what do I see as the picture of education and, and where SFU fits in it? Well, we do have, uh, you know, a, a universities that perform different roles. We have, uh, in the case of UBC, a university that is, is very much building its research capacity, its graduate programming capacity, and is looking very much internationally and, and is, is celebrating its accomplishments on the international stage. We have teaching universities that uh, don't do much in the way of research or graduate study. Uh, where SFU fits, and, and UVic would be the same, is in this category we call comprehensive universities. And I think uh, that's a category that sometimes is overlooked, but I, I think we overlook it at our peril, because that's the place where the undergraduate students uh, connect with the leading scholars in research. 
uh, in an environment where they're still very much at the center. I mean, at SFU, undergraduate education is the largest form of education, but we also have world-class research. We also have the scholars uh, who come to SFU from all over the world and, and teach these undergraduate students as, as a principal activity. And those students also get to participate in all the international uh, opportunities that a research university can provide. So I think the role of a comprehensive university is critical in connecting those undergraduate students who want to go beyond the first degree or want to think beyond the opportunities that they can get in a teaching environment and look at some of the larger opportunities that lie beyond and do it in an environment where they're very much valued as, as a central preoccupation of the institution. Now, Simon Fraser also has, in addition to being uh, a university that focuses on that kinetic connection between the undergraduate students, the graduate students, and the research, it, it also has this community dimension, which I think sets it apart from virtually every other comprehensive university in Canada. Come to SFU, not only do you get exposed to uh, the, the research and the international opportunities, you have a sense of connection with community through a variety of, of programs, through the, the situation, the, the fact we have three campuses, in Surrey, in downtown Vancouver, in Burnaby. Uh, and that community connection, I think, allows students to explore their, their learning in a way that's more relevant, more exciting. It allows faculty members to engage in research that, uh, that has direct relevance on the social issues of the day, uh, addressing environmental issues, or uh, helping to build the economy, whatever it is. Uh, that community connection is, I think, key. It also means the community looks at the university in a different way looks at the university for solutions, looks at the university as a relevant contributor uh, in a way that sometimes universities aren't always appreciated. So I think SFU has a singular role as a comprehensive university, but one that has community engagement as, as the third pillar along with, with teaching uh, and, and research. And I want you to ask you to step back again because you have this unique perspective of having been a minister in a number of ministries, as well as now being president of SFU and talk about where you'd like to see BC higher education headed generally, not just from our own institution of SFU, but generally in the next decade or two. Well, I think we've got a huge challenge, and not just in BC, right across Canada, but we, we, we have it in BC for sure. And that is, uh, we're facing, a, a, and I don't think most people realize it, I'm not sure everyone in government realizes it, we're facing a huge skills shortage going forward that has both social and economic uh, implications and can be quite scary if we don't address it. The good news is if we do address it, we can deal with both the social and economic dimensions because it turns out that if we don't train enough people going forward, we're going to have a lot of people who have no jobs and a lot of jobs for which no one is qualified. We can address both those problems by making sure that we harness the value of education to train a larger percentage of our population and people who have not received the same attention that they should receive going forward. So recent studies show about 80% of the jobs that are being created require some form of post-secondary education, not necessarily university. It could be technical school education. It could be a BCIT education, uh, but some form of post-secondary education. So we need to up our game. <laughs> At the same time, we're going to see a huge exodus from the job market of people who are skilled, and the international market for skilled workers is becoming more competitive, and we can't count on that either. So where do we look? Well, we look at places where people have not uh, enjoyed the same university transfer rates uh, as they should. The south of the Fraser, where, where, where SFU Surrey is, uh, has a, a much lower population of high school students who go on to university. We've got to make sure those students understand the importance of university, and we need to persuade government to fund the spaces to enable them to do so. We need to look at populations, Aboriginal populations that uh, are struggling and, and, and need to have more uh, access to education and support to get there in order to realize their full potential. People who are disabled, older workers who might retire but in fact would like a chance to go on to a new career if only they had the training. So we need to work together, educational institutions, business, social agencies and government. Uh, not just simply rest on our laurels and say, aren't we doing a great job because we've maintained our commitment to education. We need to up our game to target those people who aren't yet enjoying the benefits of education, not just for their sake, but for the sake of our economy. In that case, we'll have jobs uh, with people and people with jobs instead of the scenario that uh, we're facing now. Well, thank you for spending this time with us, Andrew. And on behalf of the whole education community in BC, we wish you all the best in your new role. 
Well, it's important to me, and uh, I, I just hope I can do, uh, do justice to it. But it's a great institution, and I really appreciate the chance to talk about not only SFU, but the future of education, which is really the future of us all. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a moment. What are you looking for from British Columbia's universities? Your answer might include leadership and research that makes our lives better through science and other disciplines. It may include the preparation of university students for productive roles in society. You might expect universities to enrich the character of our cities and towns with performance, spoken word, and events of other kinds. The culture of today's university is at times compatible with such aspirations, and at times it is in conflict. Universities are drawn toward a global perspective, sometimes at the expense of local priorities. The audience for research and scholarship is worldwide. The marketplace for faculty themselves is similarly international. The best students come from the corners of the earth. On the other hand, the reward system within the university has a difficult time recognizing teaching, graduate supervision, and service to the community. Just as much of the impact of government derives from local and provincial matters, much of the value of universities can be played out here at home. Certainly, the public schools are a venue that invite university engagement, but so are more purely economic ventures, as well as quality of life matters. It is possible to raise our sights so high, we miss the invitation to solve problems that are all around us. For many of us in university life, our community is our laboratory were we to have the imagination and resolve to pick up this challenge. Thank you for watching Your Education Matters.